Good morning, everybody. Am I on? Yes, I am. I've switched on, so. Oh, it's playing silly thingy. So welcome to our worship this morning. Hopefully you've got sight of a newsletter by one way or other, through the post, email, or in your hand this morning. Uh, a couple of things to point out. I need my husband to look at the iPad. Um, coffee and crack. That starts in a couple of weeks on the 12th of September, uh, every Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month, um, <clears throat> starting on the 12th. You can see all the different things that we've got planned and more besides across the month. So you won't get everything every week, but we, we, we do encourage you all to come along. It'd be great if you've got little ones you're looking after or you've got grandkids you're looking after. You're welcome to come, bring them along because there will be an unsupervised toddler area. So... Um, that means you have to supervise them. But uh, there will be a playroom, toddler, toddler area for little ones as well. So do publicise that because that's a slight difference between what we used to do before. <clears throat> Obviously, if you're able to help in any way with coffee and crack, either setting up the Monday night before or coming along on the Tuesday and enjoying it, that would be great. So we hope for a, a good number. All the people that used to come to Open Door will receive a flyer uh, in the next week. Um, they've already had a letter about it about a month ago. Um, but if you want a flyer or you want a copy of the newsletter to pass on to somebody to invite them, just let me know and I can send that to you. And then the harvest weekend, I hope you've got that date in your diary and you've got your dancing shoes on, uh, ready for the barn dance in the evening on the Saturday. And then we've got my friend, Reverend Ian Hook, coming to speak to us on the Friday night, two sessions Saturday morning and then he'll be preaching at the three services on the Sunday. And uh, as I've said, we hope to have the churches open on the Monday for us to see each other's wonderful harvest displays. It's not a competition. or a pro There's no prize, Olive, okay? There's no prize for the best harvest display, okay? There is no prize. <laughs> Sunday school starts again in a few weeks on the 17th of September. Parents, you will have to complete a new registration form and consent form for this new year, uh, just to do with safeguarding. And all our leaders are PSN, PSNI checked and uh, doing safeguarding training and all those sorts of things. So they're in good hands. Uh, none of the readers are here. Well, he is, he's at the back, but he'll come anyway. It's at our, our home. Yes, Reg, sir. Got a meeting on... Uh, We've got a meeting this Wednesday, yeah? Yep, it's in your diary, good. 7.30 at our home, uh, just sorting out the rotor, who's doing what, when, um, and what we're preaching about and teaching about. So do pray for us as we prepare that for the whole of the autumn term, because uh, that's what you get. Um, so do pray for us. So let's stand as we gather for worship this morning. The Lord be with you. Some words from the psalm as we gather to worship, a call to worship. Come, let us bow down in awe of God's steadfast love for us. For God gives ear to our words. God listens to the sound of our cries. Come, let us take refuge in the God of our salvation. For God is our shield, our protection in times of trouble. Come, let us rejoice and sing for joy, for God is surely in this place. Let us worship God. So we've got three well-known traditional hymns this morning. Lucy's playing for us, and our first one is How Great Thou Art. Thank you, Lucy.
Please be seated. Beloved in Christ, we come together to offer to Almighty God our worship and praise and thanksgiving, to confess our sins and to receive God's forgiveness, to hear his holy word proclaimed, to bring before him our needs and the needs of the world, and to pray that in the power of his spirit we may serve him and know the greatness of his love. And so we come to our confession. And we say together, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought and word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault, by what we have done and by what we have failed to do. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us. Forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. And so God forgives us. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And a special prayer for today. <clears throat> Almighty and everlasting God, you are always more ready to hear than we to pray and to give more than either we desire or deserve. Pour down upon us the abundance of your mercy, forgiving us those things of which our conscience is afraid and giving us those good things which we are not worthy to ask, save through the merits and mediation of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. And so we have our Bible reading from the Old Testament. Thank you. is taken from Exodus chapter 1 verses 8 to 22 and can be found on the Pew Bible 58. Then a new king who did not know about Joseph came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, we'll join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Python and Ramesses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him, but if it is a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. Chapter 2, verse 10. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. 
experience the reading. Thank you. I think you know the story, so I'm not going to read the first ten verses of uh, chapter two. So we're going to sing a song now, which works quite well with the story that we're looking at, because it is an old, old story. Tell me the old, old story. Would you please stand? Thank you. 
Please be seated. Well, that was a blast from the past, wasn't it? And the story we're looking at today is probably one of the most well-known Bible stories from our Sunday school days. Would that be true? Yeah? Yep. Okay. Yeah, you agree? One of the oldest stories you probably knew in Sunday school. So, we'll see what God's got to say to us this morning. Because there's always something new to find out from God's Word, even though we've read it lots of times. Uh, So I've done a bit of digging, and uh, we trust God to speak to us this morning. But first, a video from the Bible reading fellowship. As a student midwife, I get to see some amazing things. I've also seen the joys and challenges of new parenthood. Today's story is about two brave midwives who were asked to do something unthinkable, but who were able to save lives with a lot of courage and some quick thinking. Let's explore the story of Shipra and Pua. My favourite TV shows is BBC's Call the Midwife. Based on the memoirs of Jennifer Worth, the programme follows the life and work of a group of midwives who live in a religious order in Poplar, a poor area of East London after the Second World War. Interestingly, the mission building which the fictional Nanata's house was based on was actually founded by Christchurch in the late 1800s. It was then called St. Frideswide's Mission. Frideswide is the patron saint of Oxford, and this here is her tomb. I've always admired midwives. Having given birth three times, I know it's a messy business. And these women, and of course men as well, are willing to be at the gritty end. Midwives are the kind of people you want in a crisis, aren't they? Unflustered, clear thinking, plain talking, patient and encouraging, even willing to be shouted at in the course of their work. Several midwives are mentioned in the Bible, but only two are mentioned by name. Shipra and Pua, two of the bravest women imaginable, whose act of civil disobedience led to the birth of one of the greatest prophets of all time, Moses. To give some context, a few generations had passed since the time of Joseph, who you might remember with his many coloured coat. There was by now a large Jewish population living in Egypt. In Joseph's time, the Jews and Egyptians worked together and experienced a time of prosperity and wealth. But this era was now over and Pharaoh was threatened by the increasingly large population of Israelites. So he oppressed them. He forced them into conscripted labour and made their lives miserable. But still, the Jewish people thrived. So Pharaoh, in his desperation, came up with a heinous plan to deprive the Israelites of leadership for generations to come. He summoned their midwives including Shipra and Pua, and commanded them to murder all the male children at birth. The midwives refused. Pharaoh soon realised his orders had been ignored, no doubt because Jewish babies were still being born. And so he summoned Shipra and Pua to his palace to ask them why. Telling the truth would risk their lives and the lives of the Israelite children. And so these brave women made up a brilliantly clever explanation, one that would have been extremely hard for Pharaoh to disprove. The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, they said. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. Ingenious. It seems that Pharaoh believed their explanation. And so because of the bravery of these women, the Israelites continued to procreate. The boy babies lived, and Moses 
who would later lead them into freedom, was born. What a courageous couple of midwives. Can you imagine how they must have felt when they heard Pharaoh's orders? What might you have done in their situation? What would you do? What would you do? You've got Pharaoh <clears throat> came to power. He noticed that Jacob's descendants, the Hebrews, had greatly increased in numbers and afraid that they might become a threat, he forced them to work as slaves on his many building projects. Pharaoh felt threatened. He oppressed them, but they continued to thrive. And then he commanded all the boys to be killed at birth. What would you do? The midwives didn't obey. They feared God. And that's what struck me as I read this passage time and time again. Twice it says, they feared God. They feared God more than man. They even made up that clever explanation, which I doubt any man would dare argue with. <clears throat> and the Israelites continued to thrive. And God blessed the midwives because of their obedience, because they feared God. And the family of Levi married a daughter of Levi, and she had a baby, and she gave birth to a son. And interestingly, Scripture says she saw he was beautiful. Commentators don't really know why she said that. Aren't all newborns beautiful? At least the mother thinks so, and the father hopes he does too. But Moses was born, and she hid him for three months. But he was to later become the one to lead them out to freedom. He was the one that was going to lead them out to freedom. Amazing how God works, isn't it? And I found this lovely quote. It kind of ties into what we were saying last week about we see parallels of... We see Jesus throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, when we were looking at Joseph. But this lovely quote, in seeing how the parts of Scripture work together, we begin to discern biblical patterns of behaviour. And yet again, we can see patterns of behaviour, the way God works. <coughs> God creates a new people for his own. It wasn't just Moses who was born, but it was the birth of a people, the people of God. He was going to be their saviour, that the slavery would end, as we know the, the story goes on. And he led them to the promised land through a safe passage through the sea. Moses was delivered from a watery death, wasn't he, in that wicker basket in the Nile. And so were God's people in the parting of the Red Sea. And Moses was going to lead them into the promised land. What about Jesus? God creates a, people, a new people through his own. In Jesus, you and I have a saviour. If we know and love Jesus and have a faith in Jesus Christ... We're no longer slaves to sin. Scripture tells us that. We're no longer slaves. We are free. And we have the promise of eternal life. Life with God forever. That verse in Peter. But you are a chosen people. Those of us who follow Jesus are a chosen people. A royal priesthood, a holy nation. Listen to this. God's special possession. That's you and me. If we know and love Jesus. Why? That we may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. We have a saviour. We're no longer slaves. We're free. And we have the promise of eternal life. Scripture tells us that we're buried with Christ in baptism. 
So we experience new life in Christ. If you think of the symbolism of Jesus in the river or a baptism by full immersion, you die to your old life and you rise again to new life in Christ. You're washed clean. And we have a new life with Christ. The Bible tells us we're a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. You know, baptism and a new birth. We walk a new path of freedom. Just like Moses led his people. With Jesus, we walk a new path of freedom. We are a new creation. We've been born again. We start afresh a new journey with Christ when we come to him by faith. So more parallels. Moses experienced humiliation, didn't he? But then to exaltation. He was in a basket, ended up in a palace, although we know it was only temporary because we know the rest of the story. But he went from slavery to a new land that God had promised. And with Jesus, he experienced humiliation throughout his life on earth, didn't he? To exaltation, first exalted on a cross. But he died and he rose again when he's gone back up to heaven with his father. But one day he's coming back and he will be highly exalted and every knee shall bow at the name of Jesus. That's what scripture tells us. Jesus went from a stable to a cross, didn't he? And we were slaves to sin but now, and death, but now we have a heavenly hope in Jesus. As most of you know, I've taken two funerals in the past week. The gentleman came to faith in the last few days of his life and had that hope of heaven. And the lady had known Christ throughout her life and she had that hope of heaven because both of them knew Jesus and had the hope of glory in their hearts and that promise of eternal life. What would you do if you'd have been those midwives? What would you have done in that situation? They feared God and obeyed God. Little did they know that Moses would be born and become the man of God he was. What if they hadn't obeyed? You see, God was always at work. Being a midwife is messy, I understand. I haven't been that end, but I've been this end. But it's being, being a midwife is messy. It's risky. Probably sometimes challenging. And all those other things that that lady on the screen said. Do you know, following Jesus is messy. And it's supposed to be messy. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. Sometimes it's challenging. Jesus didn't promise us the easy life. He promised us the best life. And following Jesus is messy. But you know, God is always working for our good, even in the darkest times. Moses' life was threatened with death even before he was born. But God had other plans. That verse in the Bible from Genesis, <clears throat> in the Joseph story, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good, to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. God is in control. Even when it feels like people are intending to harm us, God intends it for good. Following Jesus is messy, scary, challenging, risky, all those other words. And being a midwife is messy, but they feared God. And look what God did. He raised up Moses. And as we often say, the rest is history. You can see throughout scripture God's plan within that. So what would you do? If you were one of those midwives, what would you do? What would you do today when it comes to ethical issues or moral issues? Do you fear God? Or do you fear man? Or woman, what would you do? I want to share with you a poem. Now, it's a Christmas poem, but you'll understand why I share it with you. At least I hope you do. At the heart of Christmas 
there was pain, bleeding and crying. Love was with difficulty brought to birth. Not to a sanitized stable did Jesus come, but to a world that needed mucking out. His birth no tidy affair, but through a single parent in bed and breakfast. Shelter and inconvenience not welcomed by bureaucrats with important business. Acknowledged mainly by low-paid workers, foreign visitors and animals. The sequel? Attempted murder, exile. People wounded by indifference struggle to give birth, to love birth, to give love birth in the cold comfort of charity, largely unrecognised by those with power. At the heart of Christmas, still, is pain, bleeding and crying. A sword piercing, piercing the heart of God, opening the wounds of love. Could we be midwives for the love of God, creating that strength born in fragility, delivering healing to a crying world? Those midwives delivered healing to a crying world, didn't they? By fearing God. So our question is, could you and I, could we be midwives for the love of God? Creating that strength born in fragility, delivering healing to a crying world. Could you? Could I? Do you know those two ladies, the midwives? Midwives are mentioned throughout scripture. But I don't know if you've picked up that Shipra and Pura are the only ladies, midwives, named in scripture. And look what they did. So could you be a midwife for the love of God? Creating that strength born in fragility, delivering healing to a crying world. I'm going to listen to a piece of music now. Give us time just to reflect what God might be saying to you and I.
invite you to stand now with me as we declare our faith in the words of the Creed. I believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. And so please be seated as we come to God in prayer and the response is on the screen. Loving God, you are a God of strength, of hope and of mercy. You never leave us or abandon us. We thank you for your faithfulness you show towards us when we've not earned it. We thank you that you are constant, good and true. You do not leave us. We thank you that you've always been with your people giving them comfort and guidance. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. You are with your people in Egypt, shining hope in the injustice of tyranny and hopelessness. You are with your people as they struggled as a kingdom, bringing deliverance and grace. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. You are with your people in the early church as they stepped out in faith, giving them courage and direction. God, we thank you that you are the same God who walks with us in our challenging times, giving us comfort, grace and hope. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. Give us courage to step out in faith, to live the life you've called us to, and not the one the world tells us to. God, give us the grace to recognise our need for support and not think we are better than others, but rather to live fully embraced by your undeserved grace. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. God, give us hope that no matter what we face or the difficulties that we're dealing with right now, that you are with us, holding us, and that if we turn our eyes on you, we will find our way in truth and goodness. God of strength, of hope and mercy, hear our prayer. Now in a moment of silence, we bring our petitions and requests to God. God, you are the same yesterday, today, tomorrow. You are here with us. You carry us when we are weary. You give us rest and you give us hope. We pray that you take these prayers, the silent prayers of our hearts, as we hand them over to you. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. God, may we have faith in your deliverance and timing. Forgive us when we pick up that which we have already laid at your feet. You are good and you are with us. God of strength, of hope and of mercy, hear our prayer. And so we join our prayers and praise together as we say our Father. Our Father in heaven, Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever.
Would you please stand? To God, who by the power at work within us is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus, to all generations forever and ever. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all, now and forevermore. Amen. And so we sing that wonderful hymn of trust. What a friend we have in Jesus. So go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen.